Good afternoon and welcome to our Tuesday lunchtime service. A very warm welcome to you, wherever you may be, as you join with us here uh, this afternoon. Delight to have you with us. We're going to start our service of worship this afternoon in the singing of a, a, a lovely song that celebrates all that Jesus is for us. There is a Redeemer. Let's now bow together in prayer before God. Let us all pray. Gracious God, our Father, thank you that we have the opportunity in these brief moments simply to still ourselves, to quiet in our hearts before yourself. And as we fix our eyes upon yourself and upon your beloved Son, once again to find our true rootage, for your Son and all that he has wrought for us is indeed the only secure foundation you declare that we have. There is, you declare, no other name given under heaven whereby we may be saved. And we're glad, our gracious God and Father, that in the uniqueness of his saving work, there is the assurance also that his salvation is absolutely comprehensive that there is nothing that needs to be added, no area of our life or experience that is not encompassed by the grace that has been applied to our hearts by your Spirit on the basis of your Son's holy work. And therefore it is always in his name that we come before yourself with our worship to delight once again in all that you are as our great God and King, acknowledging that you are our creator, that it is by you that all things are made, all things are sustained in being, acknowledging too that you are the God who not only made this world, but you run this world, and you do so with a wisdom whereby you see the end of things from the very beginning. And although therefore we find ourselves often caught up in the midst of history, baffled and perplexed because our horizons are so very limited, we're glad to rest in the knowledge that with that matchless eternal wisdom that is yours, you are indeed working out your sovereign purpose, none gainsaying, 
to an end and a conclusion that is more glorious than any words could ever adequately express. We thank you, living God, for all that you have secured for us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, and for all that we presently know and enjoy in the present. We thank you for the reality of your forgiveness, the knowledge that there is now no condemnation for those that are in Christ Jesus. We thank you, our Father, that there is now no separation either from yourself and your Son, for in the power of your Holy Spirit, you have come to dwell in the hearts of all who trust in Jesus and make yourself known to us in the intimacy of that fellowship that we are called thereby to share with yourself, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. How we thank you for that, our God. How we thank you for the gift given to us in and by your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ, of his Holy Spirit whereby he empowers us to live out our lives now in a strength beyond our own, with a wisdom far exceeding any that we might accumulate and live those lives for your lasting praise and glory. We thank you, living God, for his transforming work in our lives, whereby he is in all things and through all circumstances fitting his people for glory, preparing us for that day when at last we shall be made whole. At last we shall see you, our God, in all the full splendor of your glory, and at last be able to serve you perfectly in body and in spirit. And so we pray, living God, that as in the here and now we seek to press on towards that great glorious goal, you would indeed continue your work in our hearts and our lives and be pleased for all our flawedness and for all the frailty about our lives, nonetheless to take us and to use us in the furtherance of your purposes and for the glory of your own great name. Grant us then your help as we apply ourselves to your word that we may learn well from your word. To that end, we ask that your Holy Spirit himself would give to us that clarity of understanding, that we might indeed be able to rejoice always in all that you have given to us in your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. And we ask all this, our Father, in his name and for his sake. Amen. Well, we are going to be coming back now to the book of Ruth. So if you have a Bible to hand, uh, you might like just to turn up the book of Ruth. It's the eighth book in the Bible, uh, quite a short book, just four short chapters, and a very simple, straightforward, and very pleasing story. And yet at the same time, it is a very central story indeed, a very central narrative, central in terms of the outworking of God's purpose down through the Old Testament pages and the history of Israel, uh, the pivot upon which the, the whole experience of the people of Israel hinges in many ways after that dreadful period of decline that's recorded for us in the book of Judges and before you get to the books of Samuel, which record for us the, the turning around by the Lord of the national life of the people of Israel and the spiritual welfare of them. Uh, and this is the pivotal book in many ways where the whole thing begins to turn that corner uh, we're going to come back to it, um, not because it's somehow separate from Christmas. Um, it has everything to do with what we've been celebrating over the past number of weeks. Um, as I've underlined a good few times through the month of December particularly, the whole burden of the book of Ruth is, is to get us back to Bethlehem, to take us back to Bethlehem and the experience of Naomi and Ruth. That's where they go. They go to Bethlehem and everything changes when that happens. And as we go to Bethlehem, as we celebrate the coming into this world of the Lord Jesus Christ, everything changes for us as well. And as well as providing that exhortation to us to go back to Bethlehem, what the book of Ruth does also is it sheds a, a ray of illumination upon the Lord Jesus Christ, what his birth at Bethlehem, uh, centuries beyond this, what that actually was all about and who this Jesus actually is. The Old Testament is sometimes described as God's picture book, whereby in advance of his son's birth, 
Uh, he, he portrays for his people in picture language, as it were, something of what his son is going to be and something of what his son is going to do. And the book of Ruth is, um, is very typical of that. So we're going to read from chapter 2 and verses 19 to 23, just a few verses here. We've read them previously, but uh, we'll come back to them because of uh, one central theme that runs through the whole book and is um, uh, focused here in these verses. Remember the story, very briefly, uh, Naomi was married to a guy called Elimelech. They came from Bethlehem. They had to leave Bethlehem because there was a famine in the land. There wasn't food. They went to the land of Moab to look for food there and settled there with their two sons, Machlon and Chilion. Two sons got married to Moabite girls. And uh, uh, over the course of the next 10 years, um, Naomi's husband, Elimelech, he died. And then her two sons died. And uh, she then heard that the Lord had visited uh, his people in the land of Judah. And so re she resolved that she would go back. The Lord had visited them and provided food for them. She realized that was the place to be. And so she set out on the road back. Um, along with her two daughters-in-law, she gave them the choice. Would they not like just to go back to, to their own land, their own gods, their own people in the land of Moab? Ruth uh, resolved that she would go with Naomi. And so um, Ruth, the daughter-in-law of Naomi, travels back to Bethlehem with her. And uh, uh, she goes out, the time of the barley harvest, they go out and uh, Ruth goes out into the fields as was the, the wont of someone like her to pick up the, uh, the gleanings that there were. And uh, she finds herself in the field of a man called Boaz and uh, he deals very kindly, graciously with her. And when she reports back at the end of the day, Naomi is, uh, is chuffed to bits. We're going to pick up the story at that point. Chapter 2 of the book of Ruth at verse 19. Her mother-in-law asked Ruth, where did you glean today? Where did you work? Blessed be the man who took notice of you. Then Ruth told her mother-in-law about the one at whose place she had been working. The name of the man I worked with today, she said, is Boaz. The Lord bless him, Naomi said to her daughter-in-law. He has not stopped showing his kindness to the living and the dead. And she added, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers, sometimes called a kinsman redeemer. Then Ruth the Moabite said, he even said to me, stay with my workers until they finish harvesting all my grain. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, it will be good for you, my daughter, to go with the women who work for him because in somebody else's field, you might be harmed. So Ruth stayed close to the women of Boaz to glean until the barley and wheat harvests were finished, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Amen. May God add his blessing to the reading of his word. We always uh, uh, look to the Lord through his word to speak to our hearts and to bless that truth to our hearts, and it's certainly my prayer for uh, looking at the passage again today. We're going to pick up on um, that one phrase that Naomi uses because in many ways this is what the book of Ruth is about in terms of um, uh, being a picture like every other part of the Old Testament that is pointing forwards to the Lord Jesus, shedding light on him. The whole of the Bible is, is all about this person Jesus to help us understand who he is, what he's done, why he matters and how we may come to know him. And the book of Ruth sheds a very particular light upon uh, the ministry that Jesus will exercise. And the, the particular light is, is wrapped up in this, this role of what is called here the guardian redeemer or the kinsman redeemer. It's a very particular and unique um, Isra Israelite um, notion, this the kinsman redeemer. And, and it's that which uh, Boaz will become for Ruth without spoiling the story for her. And, and it's that which, in a sense, uh, enables us to understand something of the ministry that Jesus himself will exercise. And so as we read the, the story of the way in which Boaz um, engages with and then becomes engaged to and then marries Ruth, um, that is for us a picture of what Jesus himself has come to do with his people uh, who will become his bride. 
And, and so the book of Ruth is, is through this narrative of what is essentially a love story between Ruth and Boaz is providing a picture that shines light upon all that Jesus has come to be and to do for his people. And the particular lens, as it were, through which we are bidden here to look at and view and understand the Lord Jesus Christ is this notion of the kinsman or the guardian redeemer. And, uh, and it's that that I want us to think about because it, it really is in the last two chapters of the book of Ruth, um, it is essential to, to understand what is going on, to understand how that points us to the Lord Jesus Christ. It's, it's important that we understand what is going on here. Um, it's important as a starting point to recognize um, what the, the narrative here does underline, um, namely that Ruth is a Moabite. And you see that um, that's uh, stressed again in verse 21, then Ruth the Moabite. Um, uh, the point is labored in order that we might understand the more clearly what Jesus has come to do for the likes of us. Because in many ways, in the, the, the picture that is portrayed for us in the book of Ruth, we are Ruth. Um, there's a sense in which she, she becomes typical of those who are outside of Jesus Christ, uh, and that's you and me by nature. Moab, there are three things to be aware of about Moab. Number one, uh, it was east of the promised land. And as, as I was trying to explain on Sunday, um, east of the land of promise is to be the place of banishment, the place of exile. Um, and, and it's east that the, um, the, the exiles are taken to uh, when they are banished. East that Cain in, in the garden uh, in, in, in Genesis chapter 3 is sent to. It is on the east of the garden that uh, Adam and Eve are thrust out, banished from the presence of God. And so Moab is, is your typical um, exiled people, a banished people. It is indicative of those who have been banished from the presence of God. Secondly, uh, Moab is um, the land under a curse. Um, and Deuteronomy chapter 23 verses uh, um, 3 following spells that out. Um, no Ammonite or Moabite may enter the assembly of God. They are banned. They are a people under the curse of God because they have studiously, deliberately, and consistently rejected the call of God and the presence of God and the rule of God, and they therefore are a people under the curse of God. And so that's the second thing we learn about Moab, that alongside being east and therefore the place of banishment, it is the place of accursedness as well. The third thing we learn uh, about Moab um, in the first chapter particular is that it is therefore the place of death. It is the realm of death. It is the realm where there is no life uh, in all its fullness. And, and that's where Ruth comes from. That's who she is. She is a Moabite. And, uh, and that's our natural condition, the Bible insists. Um, it's not a comfortable truth. It's not a pleasant truth. It's not one that we readily take on board. We often resist that and say, hey, you know, that's not me. I'm a, I'm a decent sort of guy. I'm a respectable, upright sort of individual. But the Bible insists that's how we are before God. We are people who by our disobedience have been banished from God through our rejection of God and his son, Jesus Christ, to be our rule. We are a people under the curse of God and we live in the realm of death. And that's Ruth. And over against Ruth, um, we, uh, we find this man, Boaz, who will be for her a kinsman redeemer. And <clears throat> this, this notion of the kinsman redeemer uh, highlights for us these three things. Um, and it's this that I hope uh, uh, will help you as you move forward through the book of Ruth in chapters 3 and 4. Um, first of all, they, um, the, the notion points up who Jesus is. Then, uh, what, uh, how he acts, and then thirdly, what he gives. So let me say just a, a brief word or two about each of these. Uh, first of all, the, the notion of the kinsman redeemer um, highlights who Jesus is. You'll see there how Ruth says in verse uh, 20, uh, about Boaz, that man is our close relative. He is one of our guardian redeemers. 
Now, in the, um, the life of the people of God back in those days, um, as per the book of Deuteronomy, as per what Moses had taught them um, under God, the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 25, at verse 5, says, If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Um, and that's, that's what Naomi is pointing to here, that there was provision made for someone in Ruth's sort of situation, if uh, uh, the widow of a, an Israelite there uh, who dies without a son, she has no livelihood, she has no one to support her, no one to provide for her like that, uh, it is the responsibility, the privilege, and the prerogative of that close family to look to her needs. And uh, therefore, it is a close relative spoken of in Deuteronomy as a brother. Uh, the book of Leviticus in chapter 25 has a very, very lengthy uh, statement of the responsibilities that lie to that brother. If a brother dies, um, the responsibilities that fall on a brother to attend to the needs, to ensure that the name and heritage of his brother is not lost. And uh, it's far too long for us to read, about 30 verses in Leviticus chapter 25, verses 25 to 55. You can read them for yourself. Um, it's it's um, the whole business here of what is sometimes called levirate marriage, where um, the, the brother was called upon, um, generally understood to be an unmarried brother, to, uh, to take on the responsibility of looking to the needs of this widow. And, and that's what Naomi is referring to. And of course, that's, that's highlighting for us precisely what the, the scriptures underline for us about Jesus, that he is uh, essentially one of us. Uh, he is not only the very son of God, but he is now uh, the son of man. He is part of our human family. And the, the letter to the Hebrews uh, highlights this in a very specific, very particular way. Chapter 2 of Hebrews for instance, at, uh, at verse 11, both the one who makes people holy and those who are made holy are of the same family. So Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. A few verses further on, verse 14, since the children have flesh and blood, he too shared in their humanity so that by his death he might break the power of him who holds the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by their fear of death. Verse 17, for this reason he had to be made like them, fully human in every way in order that he might become a merciful and faithful high priest for them. And therefore, in order to, to exercise the, the role that he has come to fulfill in our lives, Jesus is that close relative. He is one of us. And, uh, and that's why both Luke and Matthew are at pains to underline in the birth narratives of Jesus that he is indeed truly, fully, and absolutely human. And that's why Matthew starts his record of the ministry of Jesus with that huge, long genealogy that traces Jesus, his human descent, all the way back up through human beings to Abram. Uh, he is a close relative. He is one of us. And that's the first thing that we need to, to grasp and understand, that in, in a way that will always this side of eternity be a mystery to us, uh, he who is eternally divine has become also now enduringly, fully, absolutely human. He is one of us, um, a close relative. He is the brother that Deuteronomy speaks about. Um, that sort of, uh, of closeness and relationship. He is one of us, not separate from us. That's who he is. Then secondly, uh, this notion of the kinsman redeemer highlights for us and helps to illumine how Jesus acts on our behalf. That passage in Deuteronomy chapter 20, uh, 20, um, 25 at verse 5 goes on. If brothers are living together and one of them dies without a son, his widow must not marry outside the family. Her husband's brother shall take her and marry her and fulfill the duty of a brother-in-law to her. That's to say, as the close relative, um, he has the, the right, he has the privilege he has the responsibility 
of taking on himself the needs, the burdens, and all that belongs to the widow, including all her troubles. Uh, that's his responsibility in the, the close-knit relational ties that the Old Testament underscores for the people of God to ensure that no one is left alone, that those who are most vulnerable are indeed provided for and protected. It becomes the responsibility of that close relative to take the needs and the troubles and the responsibility of that close relative to be to that widow, uh, her man. And uh, there were perks, uh, clearly, as the uh, rest of the book of Ruth will follow through, um, because uh, very often there was land that was bound up with the individual uh, who survived, and that land then became the property of the, uh, the, the close relative, the kinsman redeemer who married the widow. Um, but along with the perks, obviously, uh, there was a price, and that's why the, the term redeemer is, pay, is used. It's a, a price was paid um, in order to secure that. And in the case of Ruth, obviously, she had no land. Um, Naomi did, clearly, as the, the widow of Elimelech. It, be, it becomes clear from the next couple of chapters. Uh, but Ruth doesn't have all she has is a curse. Uh, and that's all that we bring to the party, as it were. Um, all that we bring is a people who are under the curse of God. And that curse is what Jesus, as our close relative, comes to take upon himself. And that curse transforms for him in his experience into the cross. Um, and that's what he does. That's what he comes to be and to do for us. And uh, he pays the price that sets us free from the curse by committing himself um, the, the terminology of marriage is used by the Apostle Paul to describe uh, and help us to understand the, the nature of that commitment that Jesus makes to his people. He pledges himself to his people and takes in so doing as our close relative, as one of us. He takes upon himself all the needs, all the troubles, all the burdens, all the problems that are ours and, and bears them himself. And that being under the curse sets us free from the curse as he bears and endures that on the cross. That's uh, how he acts. And the, the notion of the kinsman redeemer helps to clarify that for us. And the final heading, really, um, that this, this notion of the kinsman redeemer uh, points us towards is, is simply an awareness of what therefore he gives. Um, and, and it's important to, to recognize, I think, what, what lies behind this, this whole provision in the Deuteronomic Code of the Kinsman Redeemer. The, the primary concern was to ensure that the name of an individual did not simply end up in oblivion. The intention was to give an enduring name to an individual so that uh, uh, because he died without a son, without the name being uh, prolonged, um, that name would not be lost because the, the responsibility to provide an enduring name would fall to that close relative. And uh, in many ways, that's, that's how the New Testament does pick up um, the ministry of Jesus in terms of what he gives to us. He gives a new name um, that signifies a, a new status, a new person. And so you find that Simon the fisherman, uh, when he's first called, Jesus says, you are Simon, you will be Peter. He is given a new name. And, and the giving of that new name is indicative of, of the new status, the new relationship that is an enduring one. You are now a child of God. Uh, a new person with a new family, a new and enduring relationship. So on the one hand, a new name, and alongside that, there, there is the, the concern here, not simply to, to give an enduring name, but the provision that was made in the, uh, the kinsman redeemer provisions was to ensure that um, an individual did have a future as well, and indeed an expanding future, an enlarging future like that. And, and that really is what the, the whole provision 
for the kinsman redeemer was about. It was to ensure that an individual would have a future. Uh, and here you have this, this Lady Ruth uh, who comes from Moab. She is under the curse. She is in the place of exile. She comes from the realm of death and, and she is given a future. And, and that's what the Lord Jesus does for us. The reason why he became one of us, why he assumed our full humanity, is that as our close relative, as our brother, he might then take on himself all that we bring to the party, which is just that mess, that curse, the, the problems and the troubles that there are, uh, and he takes all of that upon himself in a committed, covenanted, pledged relationship of love in order to give to you and to me a future. And, uh, and maybe that's what you need to hear today. Uh, maybe that's just pure and simple what you need to hear in the face of all the problems that you are where you think it's just getting darker and more difficult by the moment and you wonder what is the, the coming days going to bring? Is it just a dead end for me? Um, I know the plans that I have for you, says the Lord, plans to give you hope and to give you a future. Um, and that's what the provision of the kinsman redeemer does, gives a person a future. And as it points us forward to the Lord Jesus Christ in a much more expansive way, that's what he has come to do and that's what he's come to give. And that is always what is extended to us in him. May you rest in that knowledge, therefore, that the future is indeed his. It's a future that is uh, expanding in terms of its brightness and its goodness. He has set you in the path of life. And that first gleam of dawn grows ever brighter until full day. May he bless his word then to your heart and encourage you through this week. And may you know God's blessing and peace throughout these coming days. Amen.